Thank you, Amanda. Well, friends, I've chosen this image of uh, many images that uh, I found uh, to symbolize what we're thinking about this morning. Uh, I've used it on the cover of the leaflet, which you can download from the church's webpage. And uh, it depicts uh, the outline, as you can see, of a head. And it says, receive the mind of Christ. And then underneath it has an image of the word loading and a, and a little circle. If only it were so easy to download the mind of Christ. The apostle has been writing to, to Philippi and he's got these words, these amazing words to share with the, the, the Christians who have gathered there and who, like other Christians, would meet on the first day of the week. And I, I hope in this short time to just uh, explore the words and be affected by what it has to say to us about Jesus. At the heart of the letter to the Philippians, this is the central text I would suggest to you. And uh, the, the passage that, uh, the name that I've given to, the, uh, to our reflection this morning is uh, Carmen Christi. Um, Carmen is the Latin word for song. So this is a song of Christ. This is a title that was used by a uh, an English theologian named Ralph Martin, uh, he wrote a tract uh, studying the song and it had for many years been realized that this passage of scripture wasn't just prose, it was more than prose. It had a cadence to it. It had a sort of fall and rise. It had a lyrical quality. We don't actually know if it was ever a song. Some people would prefer to call it a poem. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know if it uh, was it there from the early days. Uh, certainly it was there from around the year 60 when this letter was, was written. And it might have been there in the, around the year 50 when the apostle uh, was in jail in Philippi and was singing hymns to pra of praise to Christ in the jail that night. It, I like to think that this is maybe something they scribbled down on a piece of paper or parchment or something. But of course it wasn't quite like that in the ancient world. In our books, in our Bibles, we can depict this as, uh, as poetry by giving it a bit more space and spreading it out. But you need to remember that in the ancient world, a sheet of papyrus was an expensive thing. How expensive? I used to tell boys that a sheet of papyrus was about a day's wage for a working man, which meant that it was about the cost of an iPad. Now, if you've got that expense in front of you, you didn't want to waste space by opening it out. In fact, they didn't even put spaces between words. If you look at the Greek texts that we have, the most ancient ones on papyrus, uh, you'll discover that they're capital letters all up against one another, and you have to work out where the spaces go because they couldn't afford to waste the space. Later on, of course, uh, the idea of running writing came in, and then after that, of course, much later, the idea of printing. And even if you look at early printed books, you find they're harder to read because the separations are not as clear. We're used to graphic Bibles, and indeed I'm using one that spreads out the text and includes line drawings for people who, like me, have a reading vocabulary of about a newspaper quality. So here we have what I'm calling a song of Christ. And this is our second study in the Philippi letter. And there are four things I want to draw to your attention. I want to draw to your attention the pre-existence, the idea of pre-existence. Then I want to talk to you about humiliation. We're talking here about Christ, pre-existence, humiliation, and then exaltation, verses 10 through 12. And then finally, the invitation to imitation. Where are we? We're in the ancient world. We're on Paul's second missionary journey. We've got as far as Philippi. We're lingering here just to look back and think about uh, how Paul saw the people at Philippi, how he rejoiced in them and their ongoing commitment to Jesus, and how he was uh, encouraged by the visit of Epaphroditus with a gift from them. We believe he was almost certainly in jail in Rome at this time. And this was a great encouragement to him. And he talks about this, as we saw last week in the first chapter, about whether he lives or dies. 
It's, it's neither one, way, one thing or another to him, but he's rejoicing, and you get this theme of rejoicing in the letter. And we come to this word pre-existence. So let's just think about this. When the Jews thought of someone having the form of God, it would be natural to think of Adam. You remember from the beginning of the Hebrew Bible, Adam was made in the image of God. And what did Adam want in the, in, as an image bearer? Well, he wanted to be God. This was the temptation that came to him. You will be as gods. And so that was the step that humanity took. That's the step we take. That's our natural drive, to acquire power, to be influential, to be an influencer, as the word is today. Uh, and again and again we hear this, this spoken of. Now, the song, the Carmen Christi, tells us that Jesus was already in the form of God, that he was there with the Father. He, he, the, the word is morphe, the Greek word, we get metamorphosis from it. So he, Jesus was always in the form of God, and he didn't think, says the, says the writer, whether it was Paul or whether it was a, a song that Paul had taken to endorse, he, he didn't think equality with God was something he should cling to. It wasn't something that he was tenaciously wanting to hold on to at all costs. No. In contrast, he who was from eternity God was prepared to relinquish to step away from that. And Tom Wright says, and I think a very telling remark, he says, this is not simply a new view about Jesus. It is a new understanding of God. The pre-existent son regarded equality with God not as excusing him from the task of redemptive suffering and death, but actually uniquely qualifying him for what it meant to be the Savior. So uniquely qualifying him for that vocation. How, how would Jesus really put into action what this really meant? This was a decision to show what it meant to be God. Oh, this is a new idea of God. There wasn't a God like this anywhere in the ancient world. And I don't think that there is any other God like this today. It meant humiliation. So it's a path of downward mobility, just the opposite of what we normally pursue. He chose the path, the word is, of a slave. We, we moderate it in our English Bibles by talking about becoming a servant, the servant of God. But the word is doulos, and it meant a slave. The, the text goes on to say he, he emptied himself. There's a huge amount of literature about the, these few words. I have to, to say this to you. I, I, I looked up one article on the current literature on this, and it listed 40 books that have been written in the last 40 years about these few verses alone. Not looking at Philippians overall, but just about this song because it's intrigued people. They're trying probing it and looking at the vocabulary and wondering where it might have come from and when did it appear on the scene it's it's deeply studied but the word here is that he humbled himself he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant the uh, Heidelberg Westminster Catechism says that he took a true body and a reasonable soul well, this is the Christmas message that he became incarnate enfleshed so he took the form of a servant. Who did he take this form to serve? What was the movement here? Being found in form as a man, he humbled himself further, becoming obedient to death. Yes, says the song, even death on a cross. So this is downward mobility. That's what the song is about. It's about the humiliation of Christ. It's about giving up power. Again and again we hear about people with power exploiting those below them. It's a, a recurring theme in the literature of today and probably in the literature of every day. I've never been as conscious uh, of powerful men unable to give up power. 
people who have been in seats of power for year after year after year and keep manipulating the scene so that they can hold on to power. But the Christian message is the other way around entirely. What it's doing here is extolling one who gives up power, who comes to serve, to show love and compassion and grace. We get a similar echo of this sort of thinking. You remember in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians in chapter 8, he says, you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we through his poverty might be made rich. You get this message in beautiful lyrical uh, qualities here and there in the letters of Paul. And indeed, if you look at this carefully, and some of the recent scholarship about it has, has looked carefully at Isaiah 53 and seen that same downward pattern in Isaiah 53, the one who was the servant of the Lord and, and who stepped forward into, who didn't speak up in his own defense, who was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation, for he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken, says the prophet. So this is Jesus giving up power. Now how did God the Father feel about his beloved son? This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Well, exaltation is the response of the Father. The, the uh, text runs like this, if we can if we can add in uh, that sort of upward trajectory, God highly exalted him. If we begin at the bottom, allowed him the name that is above, allocated the name that is above every name to him. That at the name that belongs to Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess in heaven and earth and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the upward trajectory. This shows us what God values. And what is the most primary Christian confession? What was it that Lydia at Philippi remembered? She heard that Jesus was Lord. That's the Christian confession. Jesus is, he is king. There is no God but, but Jesus. Jesus has taken over. Caesar is not king. Caesar doesn't own me. I do not belong to Caesar. I belong to Jesus. He is my Savior. He is my Lord. And he is the one in whose steps I follow. The uh, second, second chapter of the letter of the Hebrews has this beautiful saying that talking about angels and the unseen world says, God didn't take on angels, but he took on the descendants of Abraham. He took on human flesh. He took on people. And it's people that he redeems. So here is this. And how does he redeem them? Through the cross. He bears the scars. No other God, as I've already said, bears the scars. And why does Paul take us on this journey? Well, I want to say to you, it's an invitation to imitation. Tom Wright puts it this way. Sorry, this is Tom Torrance, another Tom. Uh, Scottish theologian. Um, Tom Torrance says this, God loves you so utterly and so completely that he has given himself for you in Jesus Christ, his beloved son, and has thereby pledged his, his very being as God to, for your salvation. In Jesus Christ, God has actualized his unconditional love for you in your human nature. In such, uh, in such a once-for-all way that he cannot go back upon it without undoing the incarnation and the cross and thereby denying himself. God cannot deny himself. This is what God has written into history. These events are well attested. The Gospels all point to this climactic conclusion. That in Christ he has redeemed himself and committed himself to his human family. So Paul tells us this. This great downward trajectory of Jesus. 
that he might gather up and bring before the Heavenly Father, as one part of Scripture says, here am I and the children God has given me. Why is Paul giving us this amazing statement here? What is he trying to drive home? Well, I think I noticed in, in my younger days the uh, astonishing questioning at the beginning of the chapter which you heard Amanda read. Why is he saying this? If there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation, if any love, if any tender affection and mercy, fulfill my joy. He's, it's the theme of joy. The apostle is looking for, for a, a rejoicing in, in something that he wants to happen. And what is it? It's there in verses uh, 1 to 5. What does he say? He says, uh, the attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. Let this mind be in you. You should think this way. My dear Philippians, this is the only way to avoid really a tyranny, the tyranny of self-promotion. You know, if we want to be significant, if we want to promote ourselves, and make ourselves uh, known, we, we actually begin a kind of slavery, uh, self-promotion. It's an unending thing because there'll always be somebody we want to be better known than or somebody that has more state of this week I've been listening to the tragic tale of a church in uh, Seattle in America and uh, it's called the church was called Mars Hill and it was an amazing church and a lot of amazing things happened there and a lot of things were really good things but the church died and why did it die well one of the, tr the tragic elements is that there was a, the tyranny of seeking to be bigger and more, of more influence. And uh, I, I don't often remark about other churches, but I've been listening to, to uh, podcasts of the, the death of this church, and it's really humbling to see how how a church could implode because the, uh, the, there were theological errors, there's no doubt, but the idea of coming down and down, which was there in part, it did not drive the core of the church. And the church uh, leaders became impressed with their own importance and power. The... Uh, after addressing uh, the Albert Hall, yes, I, I said it was a church in Seattle, but the minister was invited to preach in uh, the Albert Hall in London, and uh, he signed autographs for people afterwards. And in the cab going away from it, one of the the men said, "You know, this, you'd think we were kind of rock stars or something like that." And one of the ministers said, "Well, I am really, aren't I?" So you, you think, how does that square with what Jesus was looking for in his disciples? How does that square with service? So I found that really humbling. And we need to, to bear in mind then that if we're promoting ourselves, we're on a, an, uh, a pathway that will lead nowhere. It's a futile, a cruel, and an unending, unending kind of slavery. The, the challenge is to promote the needs of others. And, and if it's there at the introduction of the, the, the song, the Carmen Christi, it's also there at the end in verses 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, I read Amanda, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to fulfill his good purpose. So two things I want to say about this. God is at work in his church. And his church is people. But God is at work in you. And he calls you to work it out in your daily life. To pursue Christ. To be like Christ. To have his mind. And this meditation on these words, words which we would do well to learn off by heart, I would suggest you pick a, a, pick a favorite version of the Bible 
and just go over it again and again until you, you know exactly the trajectory down and up to see what God the Father honors in his Son. And we might say, well, what opportunities are there for service of others, service of our neighbor? How do we serve God? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In the world of COVID, in the world of lockdown, there's plenty of opportunity to pick up a telephone and speak to a neighbor or a friend to encourage someone to be of service. We're blessed to have neighbors who have been generous to us in unexpected ways uh, during this sixth lockdown in Melbourne. But don't even begin with the neighborhood. Begin with your family. How can you serve your family? And fathers, how might you be a father to your family today? One other thing I want to pick up before I invite Amanda to come forward and play a meditation for our reflection. If you read on in chapter 2, Paul picks up an image from the book of Daniel and talks about God's children shining like stars in the night sky. I'm often reminded of uh, Vincent van Gogh, you know, Starry, Starry Night, Don McLean's song. There's nothing as beautiful perhaps as a, as a starry night and the stars in the sky. And that's the image the apostle uses a little further on in this chapter. He says, if you are these people, if you are the people God is calling you to be, if you continue to work out your salvation, working what God has put within you, uh, then you will shine. In the end, you will be in the firmament of the sky, as it were, uh, that beautiful, that lovely, in the presence of God and in God's company forever. May God bless his word to us all this morning. Thank you, Amanda. going to play a Siciliana by Telemann from his ninth Fantasia for solo violin actually but of course on a viola. Thank you, Amanda. A lot being worked out there in that music. Shall we join together now in prayer as we 
as we bring our thoughts together, let us unite our hearts. Heavenly Father, we bow before you in awe and reverence that you could be so committed to us and to our salvation. We thank you for all the Lord Jesus has revealed about your glory. Truly, we confess there is no God like the Lord our God. You are a rescuing God, determined in Jesus to relinquish the prerogatives of deity and enter the realm of our human mortality and while here among us to be a servant, speaking truth and bringing healing, health and hope. We grieve that such self-denial self -denial and unmeasurable generosity could ever end, and we are shocked that it should end on a cross. Yet by this saving descent, it was your great intention to display a love beyond computation and accomplish our redemption. Truly, Micah has spoken. Who is a God like you? who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. We rejoice in your amazing grace. Forgive our interest in self-promotion and help us to follow the example of our Saviour by seeking the well-being of others ahead of ourselves. We know this is an old problem, but we ask that you will help us by your spirit working within, as we work out our salvation day by day. We thank you that from the city of Whitehorse to the city of London, churches are implementing actions to help make welcome Afghan refugees airlifted from the reach of the Taliban to places of refuge. May they be as warmly welcomed as the 99 on the Melbourne Group. We pray for all countries, including our own, which are investigating how to evacuate citizens and co-workers still in Afghanistan. And we pray for the women and children and for threatened minorities such as the Hazara and Christians who are particularly threatened by the Taliban. We pray for our politicians contending with the COVID pandemic as they are guided by those who work in the health sciences, enable them to work together to promote public health, the vaccination of the community, and to support all who are in need of practical and monetary assistance. We pray for business owners who are distraught and the parents of school children and all for whom our continuing lockdown has the complication of a threat to mental health. We thank you that some Nigerian schoolgirls school have been released by their abductors, but our hearts ache for the families of those who have been recently abducted. And we pray for our security services as they protect us from all violent extremists, such as the recent ISIS follower in New Zealand. We thank you for fathers who have loved us, nurtured us, and provided for us. We commit to you those whose memories of their fathers are unhappy ones. And we also commit to you all who would want to be with their fathers today, but cannot. We pray for Joan, Andrea and Mark and their families, and for all who mourn the passing of Don Duncan. We thank you that we do not grieve as those who have no hope. We remember all frail elderly and sick friends this morning Bring encouragement to them and hope even now as we commit them to you in the silence of our hearts. Help them to cast all their care upon you and to know that you care for them. We ask in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And so may God bless you and thank you for being with us for this time today. We ask you, God to bless you and uh, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be your portion now and always. Amen. <laughs>